this morning. God, I stand in need of a touch from you. I stand in need of a move of your spirit, Lord, in our life, in our church. God, we desire, Lord, and we let our desire be made known unto you. Jesus, we need you, God. Without you, we are nothing. Without you, we can accomplish nothing. Unless the Lord is on our side, unless the Lord builds our house, God, unless you intervene, Lord, there's nothing that we can do. We put our trust in you. Thank you. 
physical healing, Lord. We know that you're still the God over our Monday through Fridays and Saturday and Sunday included. Lord, for every obstacle that rises itself or raises up during the week, Lord, we know that you are greater than those situations. Whether they're financial, whether they're spiritual or physical, God, you are in charge of them all. God, you are greater than anything we could ever face. God, you are greater than you are El Shaddai, the God of more than enough. Lord, we put our trust in you this morning. We submit our lives to you. God, would you work and move in our lives this morning? Thank you for your presence. And thank you for what you want to accomplish in our hearts and lives this morning. God, may we never be the same as we look to your word. And may we honor you with everything that is within us. In Jesus' name, I pray this. Everybody say, Amen. You may be seated this morning. Brother Al, ready to hear the word of the Lord this morning. I'm excited about what God has in store for us. Take your Bibles or you can look up on the screen with you. We're going to be looking at two verses. I do encourage you, though, if you are taking notes this morning, that you read this week Psalm 37. Psalm 37 is one of the most powerful psalms recorded in the book of Psalms. I love it. It's an encouragement to me. It has so many good nuggets within it. But this is the passage we're going to look at this morning, verse 23 and verse 24 of Psalm 37. And the scripture reads, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not utterly be cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his mighty hand. The Lord upholds him with his hand. This morning, church, I want to talk to you about the subject, my steps are ordered. My steps are ordered. This morning, I'm believing that God's going to resonate something within your spirit that helps you. And if you'll look up here on this picture, this background, our steps are ordered of the Lord. If you are able to see this, these aren't concrete papers up here, but every one of those is God's word. And I hope that you understand by the time you leave here this morning that our steps are ordered by God's word. That's where I preach from authority. I don't preach from authority because I'm ordained in the assemblies of God, because I've been to Bible school, because I don't have a doctorate, but if I did have a doctorate, that would not be where my authority comes from. My authority this morning, just like any other preacher standing behind the pulpit, comes from the authority of God's word. And these principles are timeless and will never go astray if we listen to what they say. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord and he delighted in his way. The first thing I want to talk about this morning is a question I want to pose to you. Are you a good man? Are you a good man? Many of you have heard that phrase. Well, that guy is a good guy. He's just a good all around guy. Or that gal over there, I don't know, people still call ladies gals. That gal over there, that lady, she's a good lady. She's just all around good. You know, they're often talked about those people. Well, that person doesn't smoke. That person doesn't drink. That person doesn't cuss. That person doesn't lie. They're always polite. That person's a good person. But you know, people are honest and hardworking. They can be considered good people. They're considered good men and women. But I know many good men and women who have entered into eternity lost without God. It's not about being a good man or a good woman. But Pastor Joe, the verse you just showed us said, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. A better interpretation of the steps of a good man is the steps of a righteous man or woman. Good equals righteous. If you're righteous, you will not have to worry about where you're going to spend eternity when you die. If you're a good man, there's many people that don't cuss, don't cheat, don't do any of the things that you know you're not supposed to do, but don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you're here this morning and 
I, in my own life, if I think that I can just do good things or do good deeds, and that's enough for God, then you're going to be gravely mistaken when we meet our Creator. Why? Because God doesn't care about those things necessarily if it's apart from a relationship with Him. No, but as we grow in our relationship with Christ, we learn by the power of the Spirit that is within us through salvation that we can overcome those things. But it's not about being a good man. It's about being a righteous man or a righteous woman. This does not mean that only the steps of men are ordered of the Lord, but it is a generic, all-inclusive, the steps of a righteous man or woman are ordered of the Lord. So I ask you the question, are you a righteous man or woman? Are you a good man? Heaven is full of righteous men and women. They are not righteous of their own doing because the Bible says in Isaiah 46, 64, 6, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That means that our righteousness in and of ourselves, in and of our own doing, is nothing compared to the righteousness that Christ brings in to our lives. Our righteousness is filthy rags, but righteous, we are made righteous by the work of Jesus Christ within our lives. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says this, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the what? The righteousness of God. So God made Jesus who had no sin to be sin for us. That means that Jesus took our place, took our punishment so that we might become the righteousness of God. You know, what does righteous mean? What does righteousness mean? It means being made right. We are made clean. We are purified. It is a purification sentence. It is a declaration of righteousness. We are made right in God's sight. We have become the righteousness of God. Romans 3.22 says this. We are made right. And I included righteous with God. How are we made righteous? By placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes no matter who we are. So what does that say to me this morning? It does not matter what your economic status this morning is. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female. Whether you have the right last name or the right color of skin. It says whosoever will shall come and call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Righteousness is not about your setting or your state in life. And this is true for everyone who believes. So what is the mandatory thing to be made righteous? We must believe no matter who we are. But Pastor Joe, everyone sees me different. You don't know how people talk about me. You don't know how people see me in this community, in this town, at my work, at my job. You don't know what people say about me. I don't care what people say about you. All I care about you is how God sees you. And you need to realize it doesn't matter what other people think. It matters how God sees you. And it really doesn't matter what you think about you. It matters really how God sees you. But it would help some of you to realize how God sees you so that you can see you how God sees you. Therefore, you can be a better you. Do you understand that? You need to see yourself as God sees you and not allow the condemnation of the enemy to come and cloud your judgments. Because if you've done bad things, this is, this is a, I preach this message at a different church. This isn't to y'all. This is to a church that has sinned and had all these mess ups and all these bad thoughts, bad actions. All, this is to another church on the other side of this continent. This isn't to y'all. Or to me. It couldn't be me. It doesn't matter what we've done. It matters who he is and what Christ did for us. And it, all we have to do to be made righteous is not to try and work it out in and of ourselves. All we have to do is put our belief in Jesus Christ. 
and we keep our belief in Jesus Christ. We don't get our life straightened up through Christ and all of a sudden think that it's us who straightened it out. Because that's putting our faith and trust in our own ability after Christ has already delivered us and after we put our belief in Him. Do you want to be a good or righteous man or woman? Then place your faith in Jesus Christ. You might write this statement down. Righteousness is given by grace and it's received by faith. Righteousness is given by grace and it's received by faith. How are we able to be saved this morning? Because of the grace of God. How do we receive that grace? We receive that grace by faith. Everything we have as children of God is received by faith. Without faith it is impossible to please God. John 1.12 says this, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, believed in Jesus, he gave the right to become the children of God. And that is what you are, children of God. Why? Because we place our faith and trust in Christ Jesus. A righteous man, a righteous woman is powerful in the work of the Lord. They are powerful in what they can do for the kingdom of God. James 5, 16 says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Have your prayers been going up to God and it felt like the ceiling is made of lead? Does it feel like your prayers aren't getting heard by God? You can be confident this morning that if you are a righteous man or a righteous woman, that God hears your prayers. And God says this morning that he's not answering your prayer because he hasn't heard it. He's just waiting till the perfect time, the perfect place, in the perfect location before he brings those prayers. Fruition. Amen. Now, for some of you, if you're praying, you know what? The heavens might be like brass. Why? Because the only prayer that God hears from one who's not a believer is a prayer of repentance. You know, there's some people that think that God hears all prayers. You won't find that in the Bible. God hears the prayers of his people. If you're lost this morning, he'll hear your prayer of repentance of but if you're praying, I, God, I want you to bless me today. God doesn't hear that. Why? Because you aren't his child. God doesn't hear that. But the word of God says the prayers of a righteous man or woman are powerful and effective. So we examine our relationship with Christ. We can know that our prayers are heard this morning. Do you want to move mountains? Then be a righteous man or woman. Do you want your prayers to accomplish something when you pray? Do you want to pray bold things and see God answer them in your lifetime, in your family, in your situation? Do you want things to turn around? Then be a righteous man or woman of God. Man or woman are powerful and effective. Are you a good man this morning? Secondly, if you are a good man, then God has ordered your steps. Then God has ordered your steps. If you're a righteous man or woman, you can be confident that your steps are ordered of the Lord. Is your life this morning without? or meaning does it not have a purpose this morning maybe it would be wise to look at our relationship with Christ because when our relationship with Christ is righteous when our relationship with Christ is in tune then the word of God says he will direct ourselves and direct our paths write these references down if you want them Psalm 85 13 says Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. What goes before him? Righteousness goes before him. And that righteousness establishes, sets the way of our steps. In Psalm 119, 133, it says, Order my steps in your word and let 
not your iniquity have dominion over me. Our steps are ordered through the word of God. 1 Samuel 2 9 says, He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be made silent. He will keep, God will keep our feet on the path of his saints, but the wicked will be made silent. That's the righteous steps being ordered of the Lord again. God has ordered our steps. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. But when that relationship gets off, we find ourselves taking paths that God never intended for us to take. God has a path for your life. God has a way for your life to go. He has a road that he has marked out for you. But can I tell you this morning that the devil also has a road marked out and planned for each one of us. On the road that God has for us, God has intended us to go down this path, to go this way. But the devil puts exit signs all along that path. How many of y'all have seen those exit signs? Oh yeah, they're all around. Have you ever been on the east side of Wichita to K96 and gone around that little loop there and tried to get on or get off at Greenwich Road? You know, right there by Cabela's and they have the free ladies Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby. Whoever decided to put Cabela's and Hobby Lobby together is a smart cookie right there. Ladies, y'all can go here. Guys, we can go there. But if you, if they're working on it now because you can get on one way, but you can only exit the other way. If you're going east, you can only exit, but if you're going west, you can only get on to K96 from that way. You see, the path that God has for you, there will always be exits that the enemy is presenting for you to take to try to detour you from God's purpose and God's plan for your life. And the sad thing is, and the sad reality is, we often take those detours. When we sin, when we fail, what do we do? We take that detour. So is all lost if we take that exit sign? No, why, why should we be encouraged? Because there's an on-ramp just down the road. And all we have to do is put our faith and trust in Christ again. And guess what? We get on that on-ramp. And I don't know about you, but I've been on many highways where I've been looking to turn around, looking to make a U-turn, and I couldn't find a spot to turn around. But it's not like that on God's highways. Because when there's an exit, guess what? God makes a way for there to be an entrance back in if you want to take it. If you want to take the on-ramp, it's there for you. But all we have to do is get back on the path that God wants us to take. There are many exits on the road of life, but be encouraged this morning that there are always more on-ramps than there are exits. Why is that? Because though sin is great, grace is greater. Sin is the exit. Grace is the on-ramp. And grace keeps us in the path that God has set before us. The righteousness of God's people bring us into the right path that God has planned for our lives. Don't make something God's will when it's not because that's an exit strategy of the enemy to keep us away from what God wants to happen within our lives. Do you want to know God's will for your life this morning? Do you want to know? And plan for you is do you want your steps to be ordered of the Lord then do this I presented this to you before but it's a roadmap for us to know the will of God for his people and it's Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6 trust in the Lord with all your heart that means giving your life to him and trusting God with it Leaning not on your own understanding. Well, I think this road will be quicker. I think I can get where God wants me to be quicker if I take. No, stay on that road. Don't lean on your own understanding. You lean on your own understanding and you take an exit. If you didn't need God in the first place, you know, there's a reason why we put our trust in Christ because we need Him. 
And what's verse 6 say? In all your ways, submit to him or acknowledge him. And what does God say? What does God's word say? And he will make your path straight or he will direct your path. Pastor Joe, I want to know the will of God for my life. That's a great verse that says God will direct our path. But if you don't do those first three things, you cannot claim that verse over your life. Your life will be a fuddled maze if you fail to put those first three things. Trust in the Lord. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. If you do those three things, then you can claim the promise of God's Word that says He will direct your path. The steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. Why? Because we trust in the Lord with all our heart. We don't lean on our own understanding. And we acknowledge Him in everything that we do. Are you a righteous man or woman this morning? Lastly, this morning, are you a righteous man in your steps or order? And lastly, God delights in you. God delights in you. The Bible talks about, and we saw it a little bit earlier, the verse that was talking just a few moments ago as we were reading. And I'm going back to it. I'm circling the wagons. Here we go. This is our text. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. That next phrase. And he delighted in his way. He delighted in his way. Way. Now, who is that talking? Does that mean that the person who's walking in the steps of God or delighting in the ways of the Lord? Yes, it means that. But more importantly, it means that God sees and God is delighted when he sees us walking in his way. He is delighted when he sees his creation obeying him. God delights in you. God delights in the way of a righteous man or woman. Why does God delight in you? Because that means that we have placed our faith and trust completely in God and his will for our life. God has taken delight in you. Church, some of you need to get over this concept that God's just out to get me. That everybody's just out to get me. Well, I can't get ahead in life because of the, the policeman down the street. I can't get ahead in life because of the government. I can't get ahead in life because of that woman I married. I can't get ahead in life because of these kids I've got to feed. Oh, none of y'all ever said that. I can't get ahead in life because I don't honor God as he is the head over all things. You want your life to turn around? God wants to put his delight in you, but you've got to do the things in order for God to delight in you. God will not put his delight in you when you are not living God's word for your life. That's a contradiction of scripture. God delights in you. He wants to delight in his creation. He wants to be well pleased with you and I as disciples this morning. He delights over you. He cares about you. And he loves you. He's not some mean God up in heaven who's just waiting for you to mess up and with a big gospel sledgehammer wanting to squash you like a little fly. That's not my God. Why? Because God wants to delight in you. But he does love you enough to do what? To discipline you. And some of us might find ourselves in situations where we're thinking, God, why is this happening? Because you aren't honoring God in what you're supposed to be doing. You mean God would allow something to get my attention? You better believe it. Just ask Jonah. Jonah says, I'm going in a different direction than God's purpose for my life. I'm not going to Nineveh and preach there. I'm going to get on a boat and go in the opposite direction from God's will. How did that end up for Jonah? Not very well, because the storm came up on 
the sea and they cast Jonah overboard because Jonah knew that that storm on the sea was because of his disobedience. And he was swallowed by a great fish. And where did Jonah end up? In the exact place where he didn't want to go. He just took a different route in the way in which God wanted him to take and Jonah if he actually obeyed God in the first place and just went to Nineveh. That doesn't make that great of a Bible story back there for the kids. If Jonah just obeyed God in the very beginning. But I would rather my life be like that story than be like being having to go the opposite direction, being thrown overboard into a mighty sea and swallowed by a great fish and puked up on the ground three days later. If we obey God in the first place, we can miss a lot of the other stuff that comes about because of our disobedience and wrong decisions that we make. God wants to delight in you. He wants to take delight in his creation. Pastor Joe, God can't take delight in me. You don't know what I've done. Well, I say it again. Look at verse 24 of chapter 37. It says this. It doesn't say, are you a good man? It says something else. I'm getting there. There it is. Verse 24. It says, though he fall." And this is talking about verse 23. The steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord, and God delights in him. Though he fall, he shall not utterly be cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Is God not able to keep you from falling? Jude 124 says, to him who is able to keep you from falling. Get up 
and experience God's purpose for your life. He wants to delight over you, but he can't when you're still staying down on the ground. God cannot lift you up out of the pit until you reach out your hand for his grace and his mercy to lift you up and put your feet on solid ground. Amen. And man, I don't know who that's for, but I felt an energy in my spirit just then. Quit staying down in the pit that you made of your own doing and stand up, reach out for the grace of God. And when you reach out, God's hand will reach down to you. Hallelujah. Or guess what? Stay in the pit. Just don't try to bring me down there with you. Because I'm not going to stay in the pit. I've fallen before, but I'm getting back up. And what's the definition of a righteous man? A righteous man, though he falls seven times, gets up again. A righteous man, a righteous man or woman, they'll trip up, they'll fall. An unrighteous man will stay on the ground. But the righteous man will reach out to Christ, and Christ will pick him up again. And he will be made right in the sight of God. If you want God to take delight in you, then you need to take delight in Him. Psalm 37, 4 says, Take delight in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. And I close with this last illustration. Sweetheart, would you come please? When we see Jesus come to the earth, as He's about to go into his public ministry at about the age of 30 years old as recorded in the Gospels. We see that Jesus does something as a model for us to do. He went to John the Baptist and he said to John the Baptist, I have need to be baptized. So just, uh, I can't baptize you, Jesus. I have need to be baptized by you. And Jesus kind of scolds him a little bit and says, listen, I need you to do this to fulfill God's purpose for my life. Did Jesus need to be baptized because he sinned? No, he needed to do as an example for us to show us what it was to be dead, to be dead but raised to life again, to show us that example. But after Jesus went to John the Baptist, John the Baptist took him down to the river and he baptized Jesus. And what do we see happen? The Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus. And we also hear what God said about it. The audible voice of God was present at that time. And this is what it said. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I loved. With him I am well pleased. Why was God the Father pleased with Jesus being Baptized? Why did God take delight in him? Why was God spent that day by his only son going down and being baptized? Why was God pleased with his son that day? Because of one thing. He was obedient to do what the Father asked him to do. He was obedient. And if you're here this morning and you want God's favor, you want God's blessing, you want God to delight over you, I don't know anybody in their right mind who would want God against them. You need to be in Lauren Correctional Institute because you're a Looney Tune if that's what you believe. You want God against you? You don't need to be out in the general public. We want God's blessing on our life. And this morning, I'm telling you, the only way to be able to get God's favor, God to delight over you. And that's a simple truth and a simple principle. Obedience. Why? What pleased God by Jesus being baptized? Because Jesus obeyed the Father. And that started in the course of three years of history that would change the world forever. Culminating in the greatest moment, the crucifixion upon the cross. And it's not about a wooden beam or a wooden structure. Those two two by fours up there has no power. But what Jesus did upon that symbol has all the significance and the power in the world. Because what that represents, it means that we have the opportunity to have victory and have power. What was seen as a torturous device, what was seen as punishment for our sin, Christ turned.
made strong. In our death, Christ brought us life. We have become overcomers because he had all the sin of the world placed upon him. Your sin, my sin, the sins that have ever been committed or will ever be committed, they have been placed on Christ. He bore our sin in our shame so that we could be called the righteousness of God. And what do we have to do to be able to be called the righteousness of God? We have to believe, then we have to obey. Believe and obey. Believing salvation, obeying discipleship. That's about as simple and nitty gritty as you can get. Believe, obey. It doesn't get any simpler, but that doesn't mean it's any easier either. over my life. But the only way that happens is when I live my life in obedience to His Word. And you want to know what God's will for your life is? God's Word is His will for your life. Why do I not have to pray about you bringing somebody to me? Well, Pastor Joe, he's a good man and I want to get married to him. I'm saying, well, is he a believer? Well, not yet, but, well, I don't have to worry about it. Unless he's a believer, I'm not married. Anymore. Why? Because I don't like you? No, because I know what God's Word says about being unequally yoked. Amen. Now, if you're already married, that's a different situation. But God's Word dictates what God's will is for your life. There's some things that we don't have to pray about. I don't have to pray about whether or not it's God's will for me to tithe, whether it's not for God's will for me to lie or not to lie or to be faithful to my wife. I don't have to pray about those things. Why? Because the Word of God's already dictated what that is for my life. My steps have already been ordered in that way. But I believe it's not really that that's causing us problems as a believer this morning. I believe it's more knowing what step to take next. Can I be plainly honest with you this morning? Some of you need to learn to obey God again. Because you'll just, you'll be like a, if you ever gone out into a field in a truck and gotten stuck, those rear wheels are just spinning. And what do we as guys do? Instead of getting out into the mud, we just press the gas a little bit and you keep going deeper and deeper that's what it's like when you fail to acknowledge God and fail to obey him when you know him you're not going to get any traction and you're going to go deeper and deeper but when you start to do the things that you did in the beginning then guess what you get some traction and you pull out of that pit by the power of the grace of the father who had I want God to delight in me. But the first thing that you must do, the first thing that I must do, is believe. Nothing would delight the Lord more this morning than if your heart is far away from Him and given it to Him. The Bible actually says that the angels in heaven rejoice when one sinner comes to repentance. God was doing some rejoicing last weekend when somebody came home to the Lord. The angels were singing in heaven because of one coming back home. But you know what? I want the angels to be singing day after day. I want the heavens to be ringing with the sounds of the chorus of people coming to know Jesus Christ in Cheney, Kansas. Like the Father more 
And if your heart and life is not with God this morning, then give it to Him. And I'm going to give you opportunity this morning. If you're already saved, just hang with me a couple moments. Every head bowed, every eye closed, Christians praying. If you're here this morning and you know that God doesn't delight over you because you know you're not obeying God, you know that your life is not right with God and you need to make it right, you don't know where you'll spend eternity. And you want to know for proof positive this morning that I'm going to spend eternity in heaven with Christ because of what he did upon the cross. I want to make that right this morning. I want you to raise your hand high. I want to pray with you. We're going to pray a prayer in a few moments. But if that's you this morning, you say, I want to make my life right with Christ. That's your decision. It's not my decision. I can't make that decision for you. Do you want to give your heart and life to Christ this morning? I invite you to raise your hand. Let me see if they can put it right back down. Okay, that's your decision to make. I won't belabor that point. But I want to speak to everybody else here this morning. Believers. Church, you know the way to go. You can open your eyes now. You know the way to go. There's no other, there's no other formula that's going to work besides doing what God said to do. It's believe and obey. Believe God's word and obey what it says. Put your faith in Christ, then do what the word of God says. And what can we be confident of this morning when we do that? Then every one of your steps will be ordered of the Lord. Pastor Joe, should I live here in Cheney, Kansas? Should I take that job? Should I buy this or should I do this or do that? If you're obeying God and putting your trust in Him, you should be confident to know that God will order your steps. And I cannot let you through a lot of grief and heartache this morning by getting this out of the way. God will not do it on your schedule. I like to plan things out ahead of time, but there's some things in this God ordering your steps that doesn't
means that we need you to reach down and pick us up again. We need you to reach down and by your grace, lift us up, God. Lord, take us out of the miry clay and set our feet upon the rock, the rock, Christ Jesus, a firm foundation. All other ground is sinking sand. Thank you. 